you have found the Thinking Mind podcast. Today we have with us Asad, who's going to talk to us about lived experience and in particular OCD. It's a little bit of a different episode because we're having someone explain their own experiences with a mental health condition as opposed to hearing an expert talk about it, which is something I'm really, really passionate about and keen to do to hear um, the story from both sides. So thank you so much for coming to talk to us today, Asad. I read a book recently where it said you should always ask someone where their story began. So if you don't mind, I was going to ask you, where did your story with OCD begin? First of all, thank you for having me. Thank you. I've never done a podcast before, but <laughs> I always thought it'd be a good idea to like to give my perspective on it. And even if it helps one person become more aware of the condition itself, then I think it'd be a win, right? Exactly. Well, my experience, it was a bit sh- kind of shattered by everything else going on. Because I think when I was a kid, I think now I look back in hindsight and I'm like, oh, there were things that kind of stood out. But back then, I didn't have much awareness of OCD and kind of my background and being born in Pakistan and stuff where there's not as much awareness of mental health. Mm. It wasn't until I was a lot older, 14, 15, that I started, it kind of started clicking, you know what, there might be something more going on. Mm. And it's when I was 18 that I really actually really realized, oh, I need to like get this looked into because it might be nothing, but it might be something that, you know, would explain things a lot better to me. So I guess I'll start from initially when I became aware of it, and then I can talk about things that maybe link into it from the past. When I was 18 years old, I, all I went to UCL to do medicine, my first degree actually was at Queen Mary. Mm-hmm. And when I was at Queen Mary, uh, you know, first year, there was this guy who was a few years older than me. I think he was about 10 years older or so. So a lot, you know, a lot wiser than me, I'd say. And he did give really good advice. We were just talking about different kind of problems people go through, whether it's physical, whether it's mental. And he talked about how, you know, our age, because it's such formative years, you know, at school and college, I think people are trying to find themselves. But I think it's mainly a university where you actually become socialized, mm. is how I like to see it. Mm-hmm. So I think a lot of people, they have certain things they bring with them and they either avoid it or they look into it and that really shapes their adult life. Mm-hmm. And one thing he said which resonated with me was like, at, our, at our age, we might have something going on, but we neglect it so much that it just becomes a part of our life. But we don't realize how much better life can be if we ever looked into it. Mm-hmm. And that got me thinking, I was like, I've never been to a GP, I've never been to a psychologist, I've never been to any of these kind of healthcare professions regarding this specific issue. You know, I might have gone in the past with a sprain ankle or something, but n- nothing mental health related. So I was like, you know what, I'll book an appointment with my university's um, kind of counsellor slash therapist and go from there. And I went to them and I was like, look, um, there's these certain things I do. Essentially, I'm an overthinker, but it gets to a point where it takes a big chunk of my day out. It's not just like, I'll be really worried about how my wardrobe isn't like all completely lined up or you know my pencils aren't all lined up it's more like getting an intrusive thought for me it was mainly more um mental than physical so i think with ocd sometimes you do get traits of people being afraid of germs so they'll wash their hands loads they'll check the door loads which to be fair i did do and i'll probably go into that a bit later but for me it was very much like i'd get an intrusive thought and then my compulsion would be to um just keep dwelling on it, keep dwelling on it, keep dwelling on it for hours and hours to a point where I'll research up on the internet. I used to go for these really long walks and think about it. And then it got to a point where I realized that actually this was really impacting my life. Because I think in school and college, you know, I wanted to do well and luckily I was fine with that. But it didn't really get in the way as much because I felt like I could still like advice on the side and it didn't get in the way. Mm-hmm. It was much, so, so much more in my first year of university where I was like, actually, there's so much more content than school or college ever had that I can't do both things at the same time. Like mm-hmm. My coping mechanism was I could find a timetable to essentially have my OCD have their own time slot in my day, whatever, right? I couldn't do that anymore because I can't fit that into you going to lectures for five, six hours a day, uh, seeing my friends, doing all like the deadlines and assignments, and also having time to think about this while still getting like seven hours of sleep. So did you previously, when you were doing your A-levels and GCSEs, fit in a time for your day to come on walks to ruminate about these intrusive thoughts? Yeah, essentially. essentially. But at that time, um, a lot of my OCD used to ruminate around um, exams. Mm -hmm. Because when you go to GCSEs, that's like the first kind of big exams you do, right? Mm. So initially, a lot of the anxiety was about, would I get into university? Would I get into this college? A lot of the OCD revolved around intrusive thoughts regarding failing in those aspects. Mm-hmm. But once I got into university, uh, although there was a lot more content in first year, I think my first year was only worth about 10% of my degree. Mm-hmm. In terms of GCSEs and A-levels, it's, it's a lot less consequential, right? 
So uh, the OCD was no longer about exams. It was about other parts of my life. I, I'll give some examples of how it started when I was a kid, but I didn't really realize at the time. When I was quite young, my dad, you know, we all lived in Pakistan and I moved to the UK when I was about eight years old. Uh, mm-hmm. We initially moved to Scotland. But for that to happen, my dad essentially had to, I think for the first few years of my life, he lived in Iran for a bit away from me and my um, siblings and my mum because he needed to get extra qualifications and basically just stack up his portfolio so he could go to either America, Canada or the UK because it's not, it's not as easy being a doctor in uh, Pakistan because I think the way the economy is structured, I mean, he had six kids and like it really isn't, it really could not support them. So he wanted to come to a different country for a better education for us and a better everything really in terms of the quality of life. Yeah. So I didn't see him for a couple of years. Also, I was brought up kind of a very religious background mm-hmm. and also in Pakistan culturally, there's a lot of superstition. Mm-hmm. So from, from a very young age, you would get stuff taught about like, oh, the paranormal, the spirits, this ghost. Like you always get told these stories. You'd get shivers, you'd get nightmares. It was just a normal. People still heavily believe it. And I think a part of me maybe still believed it because I was like kind of raised to that. It was almost like if you had a nightmare, you don't tell anyone about the nightmare. Mm. Because if you tell someone about the nightmare, it becomes real. Okay, that's interesting. Which, which was difficult as a kid because if I had a nightmare, you know, my dad being in Iran for like a year or two, and I had a nightmare regarding him and I was really worried. I think as a kid, normally your instinct would be to go talk to your mom about it so she mm. can reassure you. But I couldn't do that because I was like, oh, then it's going to come real. So I think that's initially when I realized actually these nightmares and these intrusive thoughts and me being really superstitious, I can't even tell someone. Otherwise, something really bad would happen. I think that was the initial manifestation when I look yeah. back in hindsight that I had. Mm-hmm. As things progressed, I think a lot of it came out as a separation anxiety. So initially, I think probably because of my dad. But then uh, my dad came back from Iran. He was with us for a year or two. Moved to London a year and a half before us. Again, to do his exams and stuff so we can move. Mm. But then by that point, what happened is separation anxiety became a big part of my life. And I remember this very notable summer, I think I was 10 years old and it, we went to Pakistan and we went there like a month before my parents did. Uh, a, because my dad couldn't get too much time off and two, they also uh, went to Hajj before they came to Pakistan. Mm-hmm. So like, it's the problem of Jamaica. And when they were doing that, I don't know, I used to, when I, I used to get really aching pains in my legs and stuff when I was sleeping. We used to have this thing where like we would get almost like a scarf and I would wrap a scarf around my leg. But I think the reason my legs used to ache is because I used to be up all night worrying and like kind of being quite restless because my parents were away from me for a month. And I was like, oh, no, what if something happens to them, this and this. What didn't make it better was the fact that when my mom was there, there's this thing they do where when they go to like uh, the Puma Jamaica, there's like a ritual. I'll explain it. It's, it's, I think it's still quite a big part of like the culture and the religion. And it's just something that you do when you go in Hajj. There's this uh, really big, almost like a pillar or a stone. But essentially, the devil was being captured. In a way, it's like symbolizing the devil. So a lot of people will go there and they will chuck stones at it and they will chuck sandals or whatever at it. And it gets a bit heated because everyone's like quite passionate. They've been praying for hours and hours. And in that moment, because there's hundreds of thousands of people there, it can turn into a stampede very easily. Okay. And I think unfortunately that did happen for my mum. I luckily didn't know about it until afterwards. If I had known that before they came back from that trip, then I would have worried about it. Mm. But it can get quite stressful because I think a lot of people like ended up being proud of each other, getting like trampled. And I think the person on top of my mother almost, uh, this woman had fell on top of her. I think she got essentially trampled. And I'm, I, I'm, I think when mom told me, I think she might have passed away. All that scary experience, which I essentially had in a nightmare. Mm-hmm. And then my mom like comes back and she's like, oh, by the way, this thing happened. And I'm like, okay, I'm glad you didn't tell me before because I would have worried about this for days and days before I saw you. Yeah. But the fact that I couldn't sleep at night and I was just like essentially restless and I had aching pains in my legs and stuff from like just been quite shaky mm. uh, then I was like oh that's not normal did you talk to anyone at the time or was was it like you said you you couldn't really talk to your parents about it not so much my parents because they were away at the time but I spoke to my aunts about it and my cousins but in Pakistan like there's not much awareness of mental health um I remember telling them that I was like worried or feeling like this and they the word they used in uh, Urdu they said gabrad and gabrad in English roughly translates to uh, claustrophobia so it was almost like they took something which was an internal feeling and they mm. made it something external, right? Because mm. I think anxiety is a very external feeling. It might be triggered by you know, external factors, but it's almost like the way they diffused it in Pakistan culturally. or Even now, like, I mean, it's my native language. It's the first language I knew. Even now, I don't, I don't actually know if there is an actual word for anxiety there. I've only ever heard gabrad, which means claustrophobia. 
And so it's almost making it into an external thing as opposed to an internal. But I, I never like had a grudge against uh, people there or the family because the awareness for mental health just isn't great there. Like even psychologists and psychiatrists, says there aren't many in Pakistan at all. Uh, I think they still have that stigma there. But if I told people that I know in Pakistan about like me wanting to be a psychiatrist, mm-hmm. they in Urdu they something they say something called a pagal ka doctor, which essentially translates to uh, the doctor of crazy people. So it still has a massive stigma there, right? So. It, you know, even if you were in Pakistan and you really need a psychiatrist, you wouldn't go to one. And if it did, you wouldn't tell anyone because they'd be, they'll, you know, they'll call it back with a doctor. They're almost saying you're crazy for going to that doctor. And I think that's a very stigmatizing way of putting mental health. So um, I told them that, but they essentially, A, said it was claustrophobia. And two, they basically said that I should go pray and that would make me feel better. But the thing is, at that point, I was really praying a lot and they, they didn't help. Praying itself can help sometimes because it's a bit like mindfulness. Mm. You're just there for like five, ten minutes or maybe sometimes even longer, depending on what time of the day you're praying. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you do it in a mosque and stuff. Environment can be quite soothing because you're just all doing mindfulness together in a way, right? And that did make me feel better. But I think as things got worse and worse, it wasn't enough to make me feel better. Yeah. So that was uh, my initial experience of it, um, which to be fair, I didn't realize at the time. I think at the time I was just like, oh, I'm just a kid. Like, um, you know, I was away from my parents and this and this. But when I spoke to my other siblings about it, a lot later after this had happened, probably around when I was 18, 19, they told me they didn't feel the same way. They said, obviously, they missed their parents. But they went, you know, awake all night, being restless, shaking their legs to a point where their legs are aching. Uh, they said, we didn't have the same experiences yet. At that point, I was like, oh, actually, that's, you know, I've got five siblings. Like, it's not the biggest sample size in the world to compare with, but, but it's a pretty good sample <laughs> size for siblings, right? <laughs> yeah, considering you all had the same, you're going through the same situation with your parents as well. Yeah. So, yeah, replicated environment if we're talking scientifically. <laughs> and then, you know, yeah, I guess if you get even more scientific, I have a twin sister, so not identical. And, you know, I even compared her with her because we are quite similar in a lot of things. That's a normal thing to do, yeah. Yeah, and then she was like, you know, I miss them a lot as well, but I, not, not to the extent you did. So there's maybe something more going on there. And that's when I was like, oh, actually, it's all clicking together. There's always like these clues in my past or in my childhood that I can't ignore. I myself didn't have much of an of mental health, right? So that's how it all started. And then you came to university. And that's when you said when, um, when you realized that you needed to seek help. But in the first year, you said that you developed some, some new intrusive thoughts. Do you mind explaining to us what those were? I guess the new interest thought they were just an elaboration on my previous OCD because I think my, all my OCD stem religion and culture. In what, in what way? I think I saw like there was like a map someone had drawn, drawn and they had like coloured in different countries depending on the cultures led more by fear, shame, and it was something along those lines. And I remember looking at Pakistan and I think Pakistan was massively led by like uh, the culture itself, societal norms are led a lot by uh, fear and shame. And I think a lot of that can come from religion sometimes because you feel like you have to do everything like to the kind of the bullet point. Otherwise, you're not a good human being or you'll go to hell. So I think when I was a kid and I didn't pray or I didn't do something why I religiously would be expected to do, like pray five times a day or read the Quran. And mm-hmm. I thought I'd, I'd basically go to hell. And, you know, I'd even be I'd even get a bad karma in my life where like I'd end up being a failure or discipline my parents or you know something like that. So a lot of my OCD was like that. I was always raised like quite religious. And, you know, even now, I stay quite religious to an extent. But one thing that was quite new to me, which I've already seen in my family do before, at the age of 18, I had a girlfriend, which there was no blueprint for me because I couldn't go talk to my dad about it. I couldn't go talk to my cousins about it or my siblings because they've never gone down that path. And initially, I was a bit like, it's someone who's a very different culture to me. It was someone who's you know, British, white, and not Muslim. I think she was atheist or agnostic. No, my family's done this. They've never really dated uh, before they got married or whatever. It's almost like, not so much an arranged marriage, but a lot of things that was quite common is people would, in Pakistan, in my family, would play matchmaker. So they would essentially, like, I think my aunt has a business just doing that. But I was like, I don't know what to do because, you know, um, this is very different to anyone when my family's done. Initially, I was on the fence about it. And a lot of my OCD came out that way. I was like, if I actually end up dating this girl and if I end up with her, you know, she's not Muslim and that's going to cause problems with my family down the line. And not just that, I, not anything significant had happened that I would, I would say was outside the religion. But the fact that I learned that I was dating someone who wasn't Muslim, I, you know, I always thought, I'm maybe going to get punished by God by for this. And uh, mm-hmm. one thing that was really interesting was in, I think it was like July of 2014, I weirdly have a biographical memory where I remember really weird dates. I think it was the 23rd of July, 2016. And the reason I mentioned I remember is that 
I had gone camping with my friends and I ended up calling this girl I was dating and we had only been together for a, a month or two, which when you're 18 feels like a lifetime. Uh, so, um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, I was just on the phone to her and somehow I just had this intrusive thought that now that I've, you know, dating someone outside my religion, I can't go back. Although nothing really had happened, I was like, maybe I can't go back. Maybe this is going to be stigmatized that I was, you know, dated someone who wasn't religious or even dated before whatever, right? And I don't know, I had an intrusive thought and it just stayed with me. Because in that moment, I got, I was really anxious. You know the feeling you get in your chest just before an exam? I had that feeling and it just stayed. It just stayed. It, it didn't go away for years. It didn't go away for years. To a point where I went to the GP, they did ECGs, they did loads of blood tests. They were like, oh, maybe something, low, you know, kind of more physical and whatever. But in the end, they, they didn't think it was because it's just that feeling I had in my chest where you have to go an exam and you feel really anxious. And it was triggered because I had the intrusive thought that I've done something which religiously I can't go back now. I, I was almost like I was choosing two paths. Like either I stay with this girl who I thought, you know, we were good together or I break up with her and just stay really religious and maybe one day hope one of my relatives sets me up with someone and I get along with them. But I think in that moment, uh, I was listening to like a passenger song um, and I think he, he said something like the only thing there's never to try. Uh, and I was like, you know what? I'm very anxious about this. There's no blueprint for this. No one in my family's done it. And then the intrusive thought made me really anxious and the anxiety stayed for a really long time. You know, now I look back and I'm glad I did that because I don't think I did anything wrong. I feel like if I hadn't, you know, done that, then I wouldn't have. I would always wondered, like, what if she was the one? Unfortunately, she wasn't the one. Uh, we were together for two years, but she wasn't the one. And now I look back and I don't regret it. So that's what my intrusive thoughts were like initially. A lot of, like, propagated by religion. And even when I was dating someone, I'd get intrusive thoughts about, oh, you know, I can't go back to being religious or I can't go to heaven now or this and this. And I'll, I'll get bad karma even in life because of it. Did anyone else say these things to you or did they completely come from within? They would never directly say these things to me because I, my family didn't know I had a girlfriend. So it's not like they would kind of confront me about it. Kind of rule always has to be because my, you know, culturally speaking and religiously speaking, um, it's very different how in terms of like dating uh, before you're married or even date. Initially, normally in Pakistan, you would date quite seriously, quite quickly. Like you get set up on a few dates. And then maybe you'd keep it like quite distant and get to know each other and then go from there. Because I was doing that, I was like, I'm not really going to tell my family about the girlfriend unless I was with her for four or five years and I wanted to marry her or even get engaged. That's the only time I would ever tell my family about it. Because I think that's the only time where they would understand it. Especially at that age, they thought it was just something people did for fun or whatever. And it wasn't serious and we were just quite immature and childish. So no one directly ever said to me that you know, you shouldn't be doing this. But I'd go to family gatherings and, and there would always be like some sort of gossip. Oh, you, this person's dating this girl, oh, so has a religion and oh, it's such a big deal. So I was like, I'm definitely not telling you guys now, you know? So it fed into your anxiety a little bit. It did, yeah. So although they didn't directly tell me that, you know, I'm going to be banished and go to hell and everything. The kind of the way it was looked upon, um, just culturally not accepted, made me feel like, yeah, I'm definitely not telling you about this. And I think that probably added it to it. Did you feel at the time, deep down, that you knew that how you were feeling was irrational? but you just couldn't fight that feeling. So with my OCD, I'd say, um, I think one of the worst things that came about OCD, maybe this is just my personal experiences. A lot of the times you have the insight to know that it's not rational, but you, you just can't let it go. You can't. Obviously, when I was a kid, I couldn't say that. When I was 10 years old, I couldn't be like, oh, it's rational or rational. I didn't know any better. But when I was 18, 19, 20 years old, getting intrusive thought about like, oh, I'm doing this, I can go to hell and stuff. Although in my heart, I knew I've done nothing wrong. I'm not breaking any laws or any rules. And I'm, I'm just following my heart. Mm. I, so I knew it was irrational. But what happens is you get really anxious. And then you have, so you get intrusive thought, makes you anx anxious, and then you have a compulsion. For some people, the compulsion might be washing their hand or basically checking the doors and the curtains and whatnot. And for some people, for me, my compulsion mainly was, I'd spend hours and hours thinking about it. Mm. to a point where it would actually get in the way of my day. And that's when I was like, okay, this is no longer like an OCD trait. And it's more like a disorder because it's having such an impact on my life. Did you have any mental images of, about your intrusive thoughts? I don't know how it works for a lot of people's dreams, but for my, my dreams, they kind of relate a lot to what I'm worrying about or thinking about that day. Mm -hmm. If I go to bed thinking about a specific thing, it, it most likely will come out of my dream. I'm not sure if it's the truth for a lot of people, but for me, that's always been the case. That's horrible then, because then you just can't escape it at all. You can't escape it, yeah. And the thing about being anxious is, um, for me, I lose my appetite mm. and I lose my sleep. Mm. And those are like two things really get in the way of your life, especially when you've got exams and stuff. Yeah. 
that you haven't got energy because you've not eaten. You also haven't got energy because you've not slept. And also your memory doesn't end up being as good because you've not slept. Mm. So the manifestation of kind of visually seeing it would happen in my nightmares. But even on my day to day, I'd get like intrusive image, like images of like my parents being in a car crash or something mm. because I was a bad Muslim or like I didn't follow it word by word. And I'd get really superstitious because, you know, I was raised quite superstitious. I'd be mm-hmm. like, oh, no, I've had this interest before. If I keep thinking about it, it's going to happen. You know, God's listen to my prayers right now. I'll listen to my thoughts. So I need to stop thinking about this. And because I'm trying so hard not to think about it, I end up thinking about it. Mm. So that's how it would manifest, I'd say, in terms of kind of the visual images. I think that's really important because I think a lot of people think that OCD is worrying that you've got germs on your hands and then you go and wash them. But with you, it was very much about these these worrying thoughts about about being a bad person and the consequences. And, yeah. and that is that is quite different to what I think a lot of people think OCD is. Did you have also the classic symptoms of OCD? And I say, in saying classic, I mean, you know, you, you, you touched a little bit on touching things yeah. and washing hands. Did you have that as well? Or was it mostly those horrible thoughts about hell? So I'd say 80% of it was the compulsion was overthinking. But in terms of the classical or the symptoms you might normally hear about, when it comes to like the washing hands, I realized when I was younger, I didn't have it all the time. But if I went into like, if I was about to wash my hands and then I had the intrusive thought that, oh, what if you end up doing this OCD thing? Then I would end up washing my hands loads. But one thing that was quite common when I was a kid was, uh, which I didn't realize was a problem until I think someone told me it was a problem is I also would get burgled or something. I don't know why, you know, we live in a neighborhood in Norfolk, but I don't think there's been a burglary in 30 years. Pretty nice and like safe, mm-hmm. and comfortable neighborhood. So there's no reason for me to believe. If there was a burglary, if there was someone got you know broken into the next door to me, and I'd be like, okay, I've got some reason to believe. But it's never happened. Mm-hmm. It's one of those neighborhoods where you would leave your door open. I, no, no one actually does that, but you know you could potentially, right? So I had no, re- I had no logical reason to, or rational reason to believe that was the case. Mm. But when I was a kid, I would always check all the doors, mm. and just checking the door alone wasn't enough for me. I think what it started off is I would just check the door. That was it. But initially, what happened is. Um, in the UK, not so much in Pakistan, but in the UK, uh, when you lock a door, what happens is you can't pull the handle further down anymore. I think it only stays horizontal. Mm-hmm. So you, the way you know you've locked the door is that, you know, you try to push it down and it doesn't go down. It just stays horizontal. With me, I'd lock the door. I'd check if it doesn't go down. And I was like, okay, that's fair enough. And then uh, eventually it got worse and worse because initially we're just making sure it doesn't go down. But after a while, like, once I checked it didn't go down, I, as I walked away, I had to visually remember that I had done that. Like, mm. I had to visually be able to like, go through in my head, be like, oh, okay, I still saw that. Mm. But that wasn't enough. I was like, visually, I can't rely on it too much because, you know, sometimes my brain can be quite visual, but sometimes not. So I was like, what if it's deceiving? So my coping mechanism, I basically would keep pressing the handle down. So when I walked away, I could still feel it in my hand. I was like, look, you have this feeling in your hand. You can only get that if the door was locked because otherwise there would be no resistance. And eventually it got so bad, I'd walk away and I'd look at my hand and I'd be like, oh, there's a bruise, you know, or there's a mark. That sounds awful. That was awful. And luckily, I, I managed to escape that fairly quickly because I think once I started seeing the bruise and the mark, I was like, yeah, that's really bad. Mm. And I think after that, I, I trusted my, I mean, I just said to my siblings, like, um, although no one had an assigned duty to check the doors before they went to bed, but I'm just going to rely on you guys to do it now because I'm taking it too far. And even then, obviously, I'd worry about it sometimes and I'd check it, mm. but it got better and better. And that was my coping mechanism. I basically delegated the door checking details and other people although there was no actual delegation in the first place right yeah but when i used to get the bruise and the mark I'd walk away and i look at them like look you've actually got a mark here that means the door was locked because you had that resistance against you yeah gosh that sounds so distressing that you went through that i think it's because there wasn't much awareness of mental health it wasn't until i was like 18 19 even 20 i didn't really realize that oh actually that was that's not a normal thing or like not the norm so you, when you were 20, you did realise that this was something that you needed to kind of look into and, and seek help. How did you go about doing that? It was in the summer after my first year of uni. So I just turned 19. And I basically, you know, realised I had these certain OCD traits. And the girlfriend I had at the time, she was also saying, I said, you like, you are an ever warrior. You know, you overthink a lot. And I think sometimes it gets in the way of your life and maybe the relationship sometimes, right? But she was quite nice in understanding about it. So it never really impacted the relationship that much, but she was quite empathetic. Mm-hmm. But she basically was like, you know, I don't like seeing you like that because I really care about you. And I'm not saying there is an answer to this, but why don't you look into it? Mm-hmm. So I went to the, because the GP I had was a GP on campus. I went to the GP, I spoke to the GP about it and I was like, okay, this, this, this has been happening. And that was initially when it clicked for me because when I was telling her all these things, she was just like, she had this like, wow, like look on her face. It's almost like, why didn't you come seek help earlier? 
because I mentioned the bruising on my hand and stuff, and she was like, she was just really surprised. She was like, I, I'm not, I'm not sure how why it took you so long to seek help. And I was like, because it wasn't until recently that I, until someone else pointed out to my family, I couldn't really talk about these problems because it's just culturally speaking, like I don't know, it's very much. Sometimes it's not the most expressive, or you don't really talk about your personal problems as much. And it's, it's just obviously I can't speak for every Pakistani family, but from my experience, it's very much like that. You know, you don't really talk about your emotions that much. Um, I'm not sure where that is. But because of that, I couldn't really talk to him about it. So when I actually was dating someone and she knew everything about my life and she had a very different perspective, her parents are very different. They're very supportive. They're very more of a mental health. I think my parents were always very supportive. They just didn't know how to completely proceed with it because they never had the blueprint for it. Because in Pakistan, like people don't really look into it much. They just always thought that if I just stayed tough, it would just eventually go away. So when I spoke to her about it and got her perspective, that's when I was like, actually, I need to go talk about this. And that's why I told the GP, I was like, I didn't really realize until she pointed out because she was, you know, she's quite close to me and she saw it from a different view. Mm-hmm. And then after that, she uh, got me a CBT therapist. The therapist, one thing was really interesting was, um, I think with CBT, I think there's been a lot of research which shows it's quite effective if you A, really generally believe that it's going to work and you think the person doing it not has authority, but you kind of really believe that they're there to help you and you basically have a lot of trust in them. Mm -hmm. And I think the second thing is you have to kind of do the homework they give you in between the sessions. Yeah. (laughs) I think all those two things add up to the likelihood it would work for you. Yeah, that makes sense. And there's two things my therapist said, which I thought were quite useful. The first thing he said, you're sitting in this room right now. You're probably still overthinking or anxious because you told me you're always overthinking something. Even in the back of your head, there's some thought going on. He was like, look in this room right now. Is there anything which is a threat to you? Because he was like, you know, the, our fight and flight response. Like we had that because back in the day, there might be some sort of tiger, lion, or like some poisonous berries. So you had to really keep your eye, eye out, right? But he's like, you're sitting in this room right now. Is there any threat to you at all? I was like, no. He was like, are you still anxious? I was like, yes. And then he was like, they, so he basically like, it's kind of that perspective and you keep looking at it that way. Yeah. Uh, and he essentially was like, you know, we don't really need the fight and flight response as much as we have it nowadays. Most of the time you wouldn't need it in your life, especially in the Western world, right? And I think with CBT, a lot of times the things they'll say, you're kind of already aware of them, but to hear them, you know, being said out loud. Sometimes when you speak to something or speak out loud, it's almost like it clicks more and it makes more sense. Yeah. So that was the first thing. And the second thing he mentioned was he explained the anxiety as almost like a tree. Mm. He said your compulsions, they're just the branches of the tree. Every time you're like dealing with your compulsion or overthinking about them and trying to find a solution to them, you're essentially just kind of branch. But the branch will just regrow. And it will always be like, there's as many branches and they will keep regrowing if you keep cutting them down. So he was like, why don't you, you know, you go all the way to the root and you try to get rid of the root? Because that way, you know, the branches will go by themselves. And that's basically what he said to me. It's not the intrusive thought or the compulsion I should be thinking about. I should be thinking about where it comes from in the first place. Mm. And when that happened, I think he actually then referred me to a psychiatrist. Because he was like, I think you need an official diagnosis of OCD. Mm-hmm. Because he was like, I think you have OCD, but I can't officially diagnose you. Or something along those lines. And so I went to a psychiatrist and then he diagnosed me with it. Uh, and after that, there was more help open to me. Because I think even when it came to CBT, I think I was able to get more sessions and stuff I wanted. How did it feel when you finally had a diagnosis? Because you said for, for such a long time, you didn't realise something was particularly wrong. Did you feel validated when you had a diagnosis? Or did you feel worried how did you feel when you when you were formally told i think i felt validated because i think sometimes with those especially you can't think it's all in your head you know and sometimes it is all in your head when you get a lot of these thoughts right so even with this i was like oh what if it's quite meta because i was getting ocd by the ocd i was like what if my intrusive thought that i've got ocd is just part of my it's just it's hard to explain right no i get that that makes sense <laughs> so it's almost like oh i'm just getting interested about being having ocd what if i actually haven't got ocd and i'm just an overthinker yeah so when he told me i had ocd and i actually scored quite high on the anxiety scale yeah. he, he said he was he was actually surprised that like i had a fairly functioning life given all like the time it takes out my day every day right you said four to five hours was that when it was at its worst uh yeah and uh weirdly um it would get a lot worse during exam season because i had external anxiety and that made every all the other anxiety worse and when I say four or five hours, um, the thing is, I wouldn't just sit in my bed and think four or five hours. I'm quite restless. Like, I'll just be like, you know, moving around in the city. So I would essentially, my plan was I'd go on these walks. I'd go on these four or five hour walks, either in my hometown where I just walk through the beach or the woods. And I was basically, whatever intrusive thought I had in my head, I would try to find a solution to it. And if I couldn't categorically prove it wrong, then basically I would doubt myself. 
But out of all these thoughts, you can't prove wrong. Like, how am I, how am I going to prove wrong that I won't get to hell? You know, I just can't do that. With all the technology in the world, we can't do that, right? It's, it's just a very, it was a fascinating concept to me because I was like, you're trying to figure something out which people haven't figured out in hundreds of years whether you will get to hell or heaven. And, that, and, that, and that's also if we believe in afterlife in the first place. So I feel like there's a lot of layers there, right? Yeah. But that wasn't the only reason I'd go on the walks. The reason I'd go on the walks is because going for like a four or five hour walk, it made me really tired. It made me physically really tired. And I think when I mentioned before about the anxiety about, you know, not being able to sleep or not being able to eat, I think when I was that tired, I, my, I was able to sleep because I'd just go back, I'd come back home and I'd just crash. It's really, really shocking and sad that you had to go through that. You know, you, you're literally walking yourself to sleep because yeah. you were so anxious. Yeah. And I, I, at one point, I never thought it would get any better. I generally thought it would never get better because, you know, when I got the diagnosis, they validated me. Um, and that was good. But I was like, okay, what happens after this? I, I could get CBT. I could potentially get some medications. And what happened is CBT did help. But for me, CBT only helped specific things. One particular therapist, I think I had six or eight sessions with him. It was all focused about, sorry, the relationship and whether that makes me question like my background or my religion or my um, culture. Mm -hmm. So that was it. So I think it helps with specific things because my OCD was so general and it could be about anything and everything. You know, CBT had, a, it was limited in my case. And I knew that would be the case. So after that, I went to my GP and they prescribed me some SSRIs. Did they help? Think about SSRIs there. Be honest. Uh, Please. So, I, so I've, I've been on um, three, four different SSRIs. I'm not on currently at the moment. But I'm just one of those very unfortunate people where I get really bad side effects, bad physical side effects. Like, you know, kind of a stomach issues or loads of sweating and basically a lot of physical side effects. Not so much mental health, because I know mental health related, because I know initially sometimes it can impact your mental health as well before it gets better. But for me, it was literally physical side effects. I was like, I literally can't take this. So I tried three or four different uh, SSRI. Each one I tried three months or so. And I think mentally speaking, they did help because I was getting so many physical side effects. Our cost and benefit doesn't really, doesn't really make sense for me to keep staying on these. No, that, that sounds fair enough. When you said they did help, did you, did you mean that they reduced your anxiety? So they increased my appetite and they helped me sleep better. Mm -hmm. But again, I think the reason they increased my appetite and helped me sleep better was because they reduced my anxiety. Okay. But it was interesting because it wasn't like it reduced my anxiety in terms of, it only reduced the anxiety. And also, you know, I can't talk about SSRIs for every person and how the effect it has on them. But for me personally, it almost made me more numb to everything. So it made me more numb to positive emotions and also negative emotions. But at that point in my life, you know, I, the negative emotions were like five times higher than positive emotions anyway. So I didn't mind the positive emotions being blunted a bit if that meant the negative emotions couldn't be blunted a lot, right? So the way it made me less anxious, it, it just made me more numb. More emotionally stoic. And like, I don't know how else to phrase it. No, that's fair enough. Yeah. Were you worried about the side effects before you took them? So I was worried about them. I think I did the classic. So this was still when I wasn't doing medicine. I was like, QM. this was even before I knew I wanted to do medicine after my degree, right? Because it was only after my second year, I was like, oh, actually, I quite like these PBL modules we had, which was quite medicine related. Oh, well, you know, my dad's a doctor, so there was always like a copy of the BNF in the house. So I remember getting to the BNF. <laughs> you poor thing. <laughs> I'm going through the BNF and I'm like looking at the side effects and I'm like, you know, common side effects, uncommon side effects, rare side effects. And I was like, the common side effects, and, you know, they're not, they don't sound ideal, but the impact this is having on my life three, four hours every day. I was like, you know, maybe I can hack them. And then I tried it, but, you know, they just didn't go after a few weeks. And I still tried them for three months and I was like, actually, I can't stay on them. And all this is my personal experience. I don't, I don't want anyone listening to this be cut off by SSRIs because that's just the, how I, you know, reacted to them. I, I wish it wasn't the case because I know for a lot of people they can do a lot of good. Yeah. So if you're ever in doubt of trying SSRIs, I'd say always try it. And if it doesn't go well, talk to your doctor. There, there's a few other they can try out. But basically, always always try that right if you can. Yeah, no, for sure. So so what did help? What did help? It's it's quite interesting what did help actually because it's not so much medically related in a way. Because I think the, the CBT helped, you know, with the relation to stuff. I actually had CBT from two different therapists a couple of years down the line after that. So, and that was, again, a specific thing. And the SSRIs helped, but the side effects were too bad. In the end, what helped is things like mindfulness. So what I realized is I actually never had me time. I think even when I'm laying in bed, there was always some thought going back to my head. Uh, and it could be any thought. Sometimes my, not so much my OCD, but even my overthinking is literally planning the next day, minute by minute. Go wake up, I'll spend three minutes brushing my two, three minutes brushing my teeth. It will take me five minutes to shampoo my hair and do the body wash. Like, it's just things I do in the back of my head without even realizing. 
So I felt like I was never not thinking about something. So when I came across mindfulness, which actually my CBT therapist told me about initially, then we used to do some mindfulness in the session as well sometimes. I think I used Headspace initially. I'm not sponsored by them, but I do, I do, <laughs> I do, I do recommend, recommend that app. I think it's a very good way to get into mindfulness and then you can extend from there and do longer sessions or more intricate sessions. Mm-hmm. But I think when I even had the five minutes of not thinking of anything, uh, I already felt better. Really? I already felt relieved. But it wasn't just doing it through headspace. I actually remember um, in my last year at QM, I found this online philosophy course. Mm-hmm. And I've always had interest in philosophy and poetry. I think my dad used to read me like a lot of roomies, a lot of Persian poetry when I was younger. And I remember I used to feel really, you know, I used to feel at peace listening to that. And I was always because my dad was reading me poetry and I thought it was pretty cool. But I was like, it's probably because I was quite present at the moment, really like taking what he was saying. So I signed up to this philosophy course. The course was called a uh, practical philosophy. Mm-hmm. So every at the end of ten minutes of the session, they would give you basically man- they would just do mindfulness with you. Mm-hmm. And it'd be all like close your eyes, listen to the sounds, your body weight, and all of that, and try not think. And I remember like coming back from one of those sessions, and this girl I was dating at the time, she's like, "You seem a lot at peace." But my anxiety, you might notice it now as well. Not not so much anxiety, but I have a tendency to talk really quickly. Um, I have that which, too. <laughs> I can relate. <laughs> so uh, I think I came back from one of these sessions and the girl I was dating she was like you seem really you seem really at peace you're not talking much and she was initially worried that I wasn't talking much because I talk a lot <laughs> so she was like is everything okay I was like no I'm actually really content right now and you know that's why I'm not talking as much because I'm I'm not on edge constantly and then we reflected on it and then I came back from another session and the same thing I was a lot more at peace a lot more content and I think that I really clicked that the reason mindfulness was so helpful was because um, I never just not thought of anything. Mm. So that was the first step. The second step was uh, I got into a lot of stoicism philosophy. Mm-hmm. So I started reading like Marcus Aurelius, Seneca, and basically like all the kind of big stoics. And it made me realize stoicism is essentially CBT. One of the major principles of stoicism is that if it's out of your control, try not think about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if it's something that you can suffer, then suffer. And obviously in that case, they're not talking so much about undiagnosed mental health. They're talking about like sometimes in life you have to grieve and you have to accept that you have to grieve and you have to accept that it'll be painful, but you have to accept that you, you're strong enough that you will get through it, right? Which is a little bit like exposure therapy as well, if you think about it, yeah, which it is, is a yeah. treatment for OCD as well. You have to deal and manage that anxiety and you will yeah. be okay. Yeah, I had a friend... Not so much a friend, but I mean, it was someone I knew really well, but we weren't like always the closest friends. But I think he told me he had OCD. I'll, I'll keep the name and stuff confidential, but I'm, you know, he'll be happy with me telling the story. A friend I had met playing a sport and he was like 10 years older than me or something. Yeah, and his, his wife was pregnant. He also had OCD. Uh, it was diagnosed a few years prior. And he basically was with his wife one day and just in the kitchen. And he got the intrusive thought that he wanted to pick up the knife and stab it. He's, he's not a violent person. He's never done anything violent. He's not abusive or anything mm-hmm. like that. So it really scared him. He was like, oh, it's my pregnant wife. Why am I getting this interesting thought about stabbing her and the baby, right? It kind of just spiraled for him. It spiraled so much. It spiraled so much that he wouldn't even hug his wife anymore because he was scared he'd do something like that. He's never done anything like that. Even his wife was like, you know, you've never done anything like that. I, I trust you. I don't even to do that. It, it was actually impacting our relationship because mm-hmm. he wouldn't even hug her anymore. So they went to a therapist together. And I think in this case, he did get exposure therapy. I think uh, he talked about it initially, then he hugged his wife, and then I think they gave him like a knife or something, and basically just be, he was just next to her, right? And literally, he held the knife for a few minutes, and he didn't stab or anything, and that made it go away from him. So for some people, exposure therapy can be really useful. And I, and I think stoicism is essentially that. A lot of religions follow it too. It's, it's quite interesting how everything links together, because... Uh, I know some people that definitely are quite anxious people, but they're quite religious that it actually helps them feel better about it. So they'll be like, oh, you know, I'm worried about my exams, but, you know, I've left them in God's hands. And that's very much like the CBT thing. If it's not in your control, like, try not to worry too much about it. Same as stoicism. If it's something out of your control, just, just let it play out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting because stoicism came before a lot of the main monotheist religions now. So I'm interested in how much of it kind of intertwines. Yeah. Would you say now that you feel after doing all that work and, and to be fair to you, it sounds like you've put so much work into it. I can't imagine it was easy at all. And you've said, you know, there were times where you thought you'd never get better. Do you yeah. feel like you've 100 percent recovered or do you feel like you still have some OCD traits that will always be with you? And, and, and it's hard 
but you're managing? I think I've improved a lot. I'd say, I don't know, 85% of the way there. Mm -hmm. And it was surprising me how I've improved because, I mean, the therapy helped. Trying the SSR helped, uh, apart from the side effects. Um, so I always think about what made it just go away significantly. And I, I think what made it significantly go away, I started really kind of following, like doing mindfulness and following like these stoic examples of like how you should not overthink or try to think about things out of your control. Mm -hmm. I think I really started embodying that in my life. Mm -hmm. And I thought the more kind of little things, let's say a test that didn't matter that much. It was like a formative. Oh, I don't want to do too bad because then I'm going to look dumb. And I was like, it's just a formative who cares, right? So it started with like much smaller things that once it significantly impacts my life. Mm -hmm. So then eventually, you know, it would relationships or religion and all of those things. And I think a lot of it over time, I think, I think, I don't know, I can't speak for everyone, but me personally, as I grew older, I became less neurotic mm -hmm. in general. Mm -hmm. Like, I think I was just exhausted. I was like, I don't, you know, I remember five years ago when you had to go for a four hour walk just to get to bed. That's just, you just kind of get fed up with yourself and you like kind of just be, grow like a thicker skin to that. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's not me shaming people for like, you know, being impacted by these problems because I, I was impacted by them massively. And I think some people might be impacted by them even in that, you know, late 20s or early 30s or even forever. Who knows, right? Mm. But I think I was quite lucky in that sense. I started really following stoicism and mindfulness. Yeah, I think also like being on the wards and girl, when I'm really immersed in like, you know, talking to a patient or seeing osky practice or whatever, like I feel like I have to be really present. Yeah. And when I'm really present, I, I it's so much harder to overthink. You know, when you're trying to cannulate a patient, you can't really overthink too much because you might get a needle stick. <laughs> you just gotta do it. If you do psychiatry, you don't have to cannulate though. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think the profession really helped. Yeah. I think because uh, I had to be really present for what I was doing. I think if I just had an office job where I was just replying to emails and stuff, I think I might be able to like overthink in between replying to emails. Yeah. Because I think for the profession that I, you know, I'm going to start working in very soon, um, yeah. I have to be very present, you know, because someone else, someone's life might be at risk of it. Well, it's interesting you said that because I think, I, I don't know the statistics, but I, I understand that a lot of people have suffered in the pandemic because they've been working from home and they've lost their routine and their yeah. focus. And, and obviously a lot of people are under immense stress with COVID, especially at the beginning when we had no idea. Yeah. And people felt out of control, out of their comfort zone. So yeah, I can imagine people working from home. I know lots of people enjoy it, but from, from a psychiatric yeah. mental health point of view, I do have, concerns about going forward not just with OCD but OCD being one of one of them about people ma managing when they're not going into an office and not sticking to their routine every day the routine thing especially I think and not even just me but you speaking to my friends mm. I think that they said they always feel lost uh, you know when they don't have a routine yeah. a good example I've got a few friends in uh, the year below just about a week ago they finished their fifth year exams uh, and they basically were like, you know, for the past month or two, and even longer, like it's a routine, you know, you wake up around eight, nine or wherever, and you get to the library the whole day. Mm. And now their exams are finished and they feel really lost. They're like, we can do anything. I, I can literally go on holiday. I can go socialize with my friend at the pub or I can do a sport because they no longer have that routine and they have to try to find a new routine and force them or mold themselves into that routine. Yeah. Sometimes they can be quite anxious about it because they're like, oh, I'm so used to this. I felt so anxious. I remember that feeling thinking, I do not know what to do with myself. You know, you go revising 12, 13 hours a day. And then you have all this free time and it's a little bit intimidating yeah. really. And you feel like yeah. you have to be filling those hours with doing stuff. Um, yeah. And you feel like you constantly have to be socializing. I don't know, this is how I felt. Yeah, you, you can definitely feel really, really lost. We've gone a little bit off topic. I don't want this to be about me. But I, I wanted to ask you, what would you say to someone that's in my seat? So I'm a, I'm a CT2 in psychiatry. What would you say to someone who's meeting people suffering with OCD, potentially where five or six hours of their day is being taken up by their OCD? What, what um, advice would you give to me? I think thinking about the background can be really important. Mm. But I personally think a lot of my OCD stems from the cultural and religious upbringing. Although I'm quite thankful of it, it gives me a lot of my identity. I think a lot of it stems from that. Mm. So I think it's the acknowledgement that the background can have a very important factor. Even if it's someone who's lived in the UK most of their life like I have. Mm -hmm. The fact that I initially had that for the first eight years of my life, uh, that cultural and kind of religious difference, yeah. did shape me a lot. Yeah. And I think also realizing, um, you know, I can't speak for every immigrant, but a lot of Pakistani, Indian, Bangladeshi people I know, the awareness for mental health is not great in those countries at all, whatsoever. You know, from my experience, the people I've spoken to, papers I've read in those countries, mm -hmm. even the lack, lack of the mental health support services there, it's very holistic. You have to look at a person. You can't, obviously, you shouldn't always categorize a person just because they're an immigrant or not. Mm. But I think, 
from my experience of a lot of immigrants do find it very hard to come forward about these things because there was just not much aware of not shamed but they were probably almost it was kind of diffused when they talked about it when they were younger so they don't think it's a big deal but they will click for them when you make them realize it can be a big deal yeah so i guess that's my advice keep an eye out for people who might be more likely to face these problems because of cultural and religious differences i think that is so so important one thing I, I wanted to ask you about before you go. Yesterday I was listening to the radio, I think it was BBC Radio 4, when I was driving home from Dorset and I heard someone say, I'm a little bit OCD. And Alex discussed this in the, our podcast with Professor Veal previously. Yeah. But I want to hear from you, from someone who's suffered with OCD quite significantly in terms of you know the yeah. amount of time it took up in your life and the distress. It's important for me to hear from you so that other people can hear. How does it make you feel when sometimes people say I'm a, little bit OCD referring to the fact that they, they're neat and tidy but they actually yeah. don't have a diagnosis of OCD. The way I'd look at it is I'm always a big fan of people openly talking about it but I think like you said if someone just kind of travelizes it in that way like you know you're just being a perfectionist or you just like being neat mm. then I think it also takes away from it. Mm. I think a lot of people can get intrusive thoughts. One of the therapy sessions I had the guy actually gave me statistics he was like the number of people that might be sitting next to that friend on a cliff and then they had the interest of, though they want to push him or they will never push him. Mm-hmm. It was like something like 60, 70%. I can't remember the exact number. But he showed me a lot of statistics like that. And he was like, the difference between you and the, most people is they just get the intrusive thought and they're just like, oh, that's so silly. And they brush it away. But for you, the reason it's OCD is you do compulsion based on it. Mm-hmm. You might check the door loads or you might uh, spend hours and hours overthinking about this. The way I would put it is a lot of people can have certain OCD traits, but it's only a disorder when it's significantly impacting your life to a point where you just can't fit in anymore with the overthinking. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned, like, I think, you know, people put in their socks in neat ways and stuff. It reminds me of this, not so much a funny story, but um, I had graduation board about two weeks ago. And I think I sent one of my friends, like, a picture of me. Like, they were like, you know, I want to see what you look like in a suit. So I sent him a picture of me in a suit. And I think they jokingly commented. They were like, oh, you know, I like the suit, but what's up with the socks? And the thing with the socks was that uh, I wear something called odd socks. Mm-hmm. So the socks, they don't match up. And they just thought like, you know, I'd been quite reckless or silly and I didn't match my socks together on like my last formal board of my med school, right? And I was like, no, it's not like that. And I gave them a, back, a bit of a backstory and they felt bad about joking about it, but I was like, don't feel bad about it. I gave them a backstory. I said, when I was a kid, I used to worry so much about my socks not matching to a point where I would wear trousers completely covering them up or roll them down or whatever. That my OCD was so bad that they didn't match. Mm. That now my exposure therapy when I was about 18, 19 years old, I actually started wearing, wearing socks that didn't match. Mm. And now, sometimes, you know, when I have a good mental health day, I wear socks that don't match. So these are brand new as odd socks to show me how far I've came. Yeah. And when I told them that, they were like, oh, no, I feel bad about it. I was like, don't feel bad about it. I just found it funny that you commented on yeah. that and I gave you a little backstory. I think that's great. So you did your own little exposure yeah. therapy when you were younger. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like I had a lot of things that became coping mechanisms. I didn't realize they were coping mechanisms until I think someone made me realize, actually, it was having such an impact on my life. And, it, and I guess it's shown you how far you've come. You know, you're on your graduation day and you're wearing old socks, yeah. which, which we might laugh about, but actually it really does show how far you've come yeah. from, from that guy that was spending five hours walking to the point he, yeah. he could sleep because your day was so distressing. I'm so glad that, that you, you can show that people can get better because that's really important, I think, as well. It's, it's great that we increase understanding, but also it's great to tell people that there's light at the end of the tunnel and, and it's hard work, yeah. but people do get better. I'd say be optimistic. I'd say don't be afraid to ask for help. I think especially in the background that I had in terms of like being with a bunch of medics or people whose parents were doctors, they were less likely to ask for help. Because I think you go to your parents and they'll basically tell you, oh, you know, this won't kill you. Just because it doesn't kill you doesn't mean it will not significantly impact your life, right? So you should look into it. So my top tip would be don't be ashamed to ask for help. Doesn't matter what profession you're in, if you're a student, if you're working, you know, unemployed, like it doesn't matter. There's always support for everyone and Definitely look into it because it might change your life. You are listening to the Thinking Mind podcast. Thank you so much for listening to this episode. If you enjoyed it, please share it with a friend or give us a rating. It really does help people to find us. If you find the podcast valuable, why not buy us a coffee to help keep us going? There's a link in the show notes. As ever, we love to hear from you and love to hear what you think. So drop us an email or get in touch on social media. Thank you so much.